please, to Hebrews chapter 10. Rhoda read the second half of this chapter, and we're going to focus in particularly on Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25 tonight. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. I'll just read these verses again. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I'm going to give you some statistics tonight. Statistics are good, aren't they? You can prove anything with a good statistic. Well, I'm going to give you a really interesting statistic, and it's the number of times that the New Testament uses a command for believers, followers of Jesus, to care for one another, to love one another, to support one another, to be with one another. I wonder if you can guess how many times the New Testament might use that phrase as a command from Paul or one of the other apostles or from Jesus to the believer to care for one another. Would it surprise you to know there are a hundred references in the New Testament to caring for one another. We have some of them in this text here in Hebrews 10, and they focus really on encouraging one another. The Christian life is not a solo project. We can't just wander off into the hills with a Bible or with a, an MP3 player and a few of Tim Keller's great sermons on it and hope to thrive on our own as an island cut off from the rest of humanity or from the rest of the church. We need each other. We need one another. And healthy churches are places with a culture where we are looking out for one another, to care for one another, to help one another, to serve one another, to notice when someone is lonely or down or afraid to notice when someone is grieving, when someone is struggling, to notice when someone is just drowning in fear or overwhelmed. We need each other. Now, we don't do this perfectly. We don't get it right all the time. But we need to be thinking, not just me and what's good for me, or even my family unit and what's good for our family unit, but constantly thinking about one another and the big picture and indeed about the communities where God has placed us. In English, that phrase one another is two words, but in the Greek language the New Testament was written and it's just one word, alelun, alelun, one little Greek word, one another. I really find this text so encouraging. You'll find Jesus using this word, Peter using it, John and James using it, but about 60% of the hundred references to one another in the New Testament come from Paul the Apostle. About a third of them are stressing the need to have love for one another. That's what the Christian religion is like. Love one another. About a third of them stress unity in the body of Christ in the church. Love and unity make up about two-thirds of the commands referring to one another in the New Testament. About 15% stress the quality of humility and of service. And there are topics like hospitality, things that apply within marriage, things that apply to praying for one another. If you're quite touchy-feely, four of them are about kissing. The New Testament writers were not ashamed to say that we can hug one another, that we can greet one another with a holy kiss. 
As long as it's a holy kiss, it's fine. But slobbery ones we don't do, okay? We are British, we are Scots, and, you know, keep the slobbery stuff for somewhere else. But, but greet one another, encourage one another, love one another, pray for one another, show hospitality to one another. Do you see what a stress this is in the Word of God in the New Testament? And it's easy to miss because we're so individualistic, we're so focused on ourselves sometimes that we don't think what impact it has on other people if we withdraw, if we stop spending time with each other, or if we, as some of the Hebrew Christians were doing, stop meeting with other Christians for worship. Some of them they were maybe being drawn back to the synagogue or to keeping the Jewish Sabbath or whatever, and they were just avoiding the Christian assembly, the gathering of Christian believers. Maybe they were ashamed in times of persecution. Maybe because there were slaves in the church, some who were more well-to-do were avoiding the, the people who were from a very different social standing and social background. But the writer here in Hebrews says, encourage one another. If I could perhaps give you a little illustration, so that it will explain the title of the sermon, which is Encourage One Another, No Big Sticks Required. Let me show you a little bit of a picture. I wonder if you recognize what that picture is from. Does anyone recognize the source of that little picture? For those listening from far away, they, you maybe can't see this, so it's a bit wasted on you. But for those who are here, do you recognize where that image is taken from. Anyone? Well done, John. There's a man who's almost French from the Channel Islands. Uh, and, of course, the Norman Conquest, 1066 and all that, William the Conqueror, they celebrated the Norman Conquest in 1066 by making a great tapestry to tell the story of the invasion of the south of England and of the Battle of Hastings where Harold was defeated and where William became the ruler of England and of Wales. And William's half-brother was a man called Odo who was a French bishop and he was involved in the fighting. He was maybe a bit better a, a fighter than a bishop. I'm not sure how pastoral he was, but uh, the Bayer Tapestry depicts Bishop Odo with a big stick. And in Latin above his head, it says, as literally as I can translate that with my schoolboy Latin, Bishop Odo encourages the boys with a big stick. I think that's marvelous. He's encouraging the boys to get into the fight with a big stick. Go and wallop the Anglo-Saxons. And if you don't wallop them, I'll wallop you boys. So come on, let's, let's fight with our horses, with our infantry, with our cavalry, and let's have a great victory at Hastings against the English. It's sort of Brexit, but in reverse. This was where Europe came uh, and stayed for a, a thousand years, um, pre-Brexit days, and an invasion from Normandy. We don't need a stick for Christian encouragement. We don't need a big stick to build churches up and to build friendship. What we have instead is a command to persuade, to encourage by the way we treat other people, by the way we influence other people, by the way we set an example for other people, by the way even words of, of kindness and full of the promises of God can stir one another up, spur one another up. So verse 24 and 25, let us consider how to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let's not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The reason for all this encouragement is given earlier in Hebrews in chapter 4 where we're told we may draw near to God. 
Hebrews 4.14 says, Since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to the faith we profess. Let's hold fast to our confession or our profession of faith in him. We'll hold up to the gospel and our confession of the gospel. We are Christian believers and we don't care who knows it. We follow Christ and we want people to know it because Christ is in heaven encouraging us and Christ has left his church on the earth to help us to be encouraged and to keep following Jesus. The message of the gospel is keep going to God, keep going to God through Jesus, and don't give up in the Christian life. But that Christian life is resisted, it's opposed, and it meets with struggles. There are three classic areas where we struggle and where we're tempted to give up, and it's these areas where we need the encouragement of Jesus and his people. And these areas are when we fall into sin and we need encouragement, when we fall into suffering or trouble and we need encouraging, when things go wrong in life, and when we feel lonely or sad and we need people around us to love us and pray for us and encourage us. So that's the way I want to look at these verses tonight. First of all, We need encouragement for one another. No big sticks required. First of all, because when we sin, we must turn to God. Look at verse 19 with me. Therefore, brothers, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, we're going into the holy of holies in the temple, the place where God meets the high priest and God makes peace with the penitent sinner in the, ha- in the tabernacle or in the temple of old. We have confidence to go there where the high priest could only go once a year because of the blood of Jesus. He has opened up a new and living way for us through the curtain, through the veil in the temple. That is, his body is our way into the nearer presence of God. Jesus' body was torn for us Symbolically, the veil in the temple was torn when Jesus died on the cross because Jesus gave his body for us. He gave his blood for us. We can boldly, confidently draw near to God. Even though we are sinners, and even though we have lust, and even though we have anger, and even though we have jealousy and ugly bitterness, even though horrible thoughts come to us, even though horrible things are in our past, and maybe horrible things are in our present. Even though we're ashamed to tell people how we've been behaving, we're living in an age, of course, with an explosion in the use of the internet. And you might think, oh yeah, the internet, I've heard about, there's a lot of pornography on there, isn't there? Oh, it's far worse than that. There are sites where people are encouraged to commit suicide online. There are sites where people are taught how to commit crimes online. One of the the bombs that went off recently in that concert in Manchester, the, the person who allowed his hatred and his murder to bubble over there in the service of fanatical Islam learned how to do it off YouTube. There's evil stuff online and there's every way to fall into addictive behavior and sinful behavior because of the stuff that's there. And what do we do if we find that that's our problem or you're married to someone and it's their problem or it's maybe your parent or it's maybe your child and you're thinking, goodness me, I've made a terrible discovery about myself. Or I've made a terrible discovery about somebody that I know and love. What are we to do when we sin and we feel soiled by our own sin or the sin of some other people? What are we to do? Hebrews tells us, turn to God. Because Jesus knew all about the internet and all about addiction and all about anger and all about bitterness, and all about rage, and all about jealousy. He knew all about that 
when he went on to the cross to die for you and your sins and me and my sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, the place where God's own glorious presence is to be found by the blood of Jesus, you know, before Jesus died on the cross, the high priest could only go into the most holy place once a year. And they were so frightened that the, the, the presence of God would strike the high priest down dead. They tied around his ankle a cord so that if the high priest died when he went through the veil, through the curtain, they could pull his dead body out from the Holy of Holies and bury him. God is still holy. God is still the same. God still hates sin. But the difference is between now and then under these Old Testament times, we know the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed for every believer, the worst believer. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin, from every sin, from the sins that we are afraid to confess to ourselves. When we sin, turn to God. Now, I reckon that in this gathering tonight, some of us think this is a message for somebody else. It's somebody else who needs to hear this stuff about dealing with sin and facing up to sin. So there's that glutton who needs to face up to it. Or there's that loud person who needs to face up to it. Or there's that selfish person who needs to face up to it. Or there's that person who's covered from here to their toes and tattoos, and they need to face up to it. But I don't, because I'm relying on myself and the fact that I'm always in church and that I'm an okay person. We've got to learn to stop relying on the things we boast and brag in and begin relying on the blood of Jesus Christ. Exchange self-confidence for trust and hope in the blood of Jesus because only the blood of Jesus qualifies us to come into the most holy place. We can have confidence approaching God because Christ died for sinners. And the worst person here tonight can have confidence that God will not turn you away. All he looks for is the mark. The mark of the blood. Are you trusting in Jesus? Are you putting your confidence in Jesus? He's the priest who blots out our shame. He's the priest who blots out our guilt. He's the priest who blots out our past and our present so that we may draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, washed, cleansed from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Have you ever lain awake at two, three, four in the morning and there's a picture, there's a picture in your head and you say, I wish I could take those words back, or I wish I could take that action back, or Lord, I've let you down in a way, and I, I've, I've just, I just don't know how I can face another day. But the blood of Jesus Christ answers our self-accusation and the accusations of Satan as well. We deal with sin by repenting and turning to God and by pleading to God, Lord God, your son died for sinners and I am turning in full assurance of faith, asking to be sprinkled, to be washed, to be cleansed and to have my mind washed and my body washed and my future washed by the cleansing Lord Jesus Christ. When you sin. You must flee, run, turn to God. And you must, as a believer, encourage others to do the same. 
Don't be so busy pointing the finger at somebody else and making them feel small that you forget to tell them, Jesus is where you must go. Be quick to forgive others and be quick to tell others, I'm a sinner too and Jesus is my hope. Turn to him. Embrace him. When we sin, is that a reason to turn away? No, it's a reason to turn to God. But the second problem, the thing that discourages us, the thing that leaves us flat and empty, is pain and suffering and disappointment. When we suffer, what are we to do? When we suffer, we are to hope in God's promises. So notice with me what the writer says in verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. What's the reason to hang on to Christianity and saying, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe Jesus died for sin. I believe he rose again on the third day. I believe he's coming again. I believe he's Lord and King. I believe he's Judge. I believe the Holy Spirit is working in the nations and working in this place. What's the reason to carry on? Because we feel buoyed up because we've sung some songs that make us feel good, because we've, I don't know, we've got a nice house and a nice car and a nice job. No, the reason to be encouraged is that God has made promises. That's the best answer to disappointment and pain and suffering. Because if, if my idea of being secure comes from being in good health or being young, or looking good, or having a nice wardrobe of clothes to put on, or having a really nice bunch of friends. Well, my friends could turn on me, or they could all move away. They could all go and join the Navy and be posted far, far away. Or my friends could decide they don't want to be my friends anymore. I don't get my sense of worth from a friendship group. And I don't get my sense of worth from a job, or a career, or doing well in education, or whatever it might be. Because suffering can put an end to all of that stuff. You know, one of the big problems today is the brokenness of families. And it may be that we cannot rely upon a mum or a dad, or we cannot rely upon the people we knew in school, or we cannot rely, it seems, it, sometimes it feels like we cannot rely on another human being. That everybody is letting us down. And there's so much pain and so much brokenness in this world. But it is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful when we see God at work. We heard a little of that this morning and saw some of the images of people on the streets in one of the most densely populated cities in the world just with a basketball hoop and with a basketball, multicolored basketball, the colors of the basketball telling the gospel story. Gold for the king of kings, black on the basketball for the darkness of our sin, green for growth and new life and so on. What a marvelous way to share the gospel with children who may not have anyone looking after them and who may not have anything to go home to. The Lord Jesus gives hope and encouragement through what he's done and what he's promised to do, through his promises. So we keep going and we hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. When we say we're Christians, we're followers of Jesus, we're saying he who promised is faithful and he will not let us down. There will be a better day. There will be a tomorrow. The best reason for hope is not that there's a pay rise coming. The best reason for hope is not that that girl in my college course 
has taken an interest in me. The best reason for hope is not that I'm going to retire in six months and tend my garden for the next few years. The best reason for hope is that God has spoken and God is faithful. That's what this verse is all about. But Hebrews is saying to us, if you've learned this lesson, encourage others with this lesson. Pass it on. When you've learned the lesson that God welcomes sinners who turn to him, pass that message on. And when you've learned the lesson that when we face suffering and disappointment and, and confusion, that we can still cling to the God of promises and the God who says, the future is mine and I'm holding it. Pass that encouragement on to others. And the last thing, the third thing tonight, is when we're lonely and when we're weak, what are we to do? When we've maybe been let down and we've maybe been isolated, what are we to do? When we're lonely and weak, we are to help each other to go forwards. We are to encourage one another in the Christian way. And that really is what our text in verse 24 and verse 25 is all about. Let's consider how we may spur one another on, not with the big stick of Bishop Odo, not with a, a spear up the backside, but that we will use the fellowship of Christians and the love of Christians to spur one another on towards love for God, love for each other, and good deeds, yes, to be doing things that are a blessing to others and to ourselves. Let's not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day, the day of God approaching, the day when Jesus will return. Until Jesus returns, keep meeting Christians. K keep spending time in friendship and fellowship and, and doing life with Christians. Be part of a church. It may not be the greatest church on earth, but be part of it. Love the people there as your family. Worship with them. Pray with them. Weep tears with them sometimes. And that will encourage others, and that will encourage you. It's not just the meeting together that we need. It's the meeting in such a way that our lives touch one another. It's the meeting in such a way that we're able to help each other to go back to the gospel, and back to the gospel, and back to the gospel, and keeping on going as Christians. I'm not sure that a church where all we do is bicker is going to be very helpful in that project. I'm not sure if a church where all we do is, is dot the I's and cross the T's of saying, well, I, I think I, I agree with all the correct doctrine. That's important. But if that's all we do, but we don't love each other and have fellowship with one another, we're, we're in trouble. I, I do think we in the Reformed churches, in the Presbyterian churches, in the Dutch tradition and the Scottish tradition and in the North American tradition and the South African tradition, you know, I think we need to notice other bits of the church. I think we could learn a great deal from the Pentecostal churches. I really think we could about the way people care for each other and share one another's burdens and pray for each other. I'm not going to say accept all, all the beliefs and all the doctrine and all the practice, but that we notice that God by his Holy Spirit is very good at creating lively churches all around the world in different cultures, and we can learn from the best of them. We can learn from churches where generally people are poor, because generally Christians who are poor are not in love with money and they share what they have. I remember hearing all these stories from my grandparents, my two grandmothers who were Christian women who I suppose came to faith around the war years, the 1930s, 1940s. And they would talk about praying to God 
about how they would put a pair of shoes onto the feet of their children going to school. I've honestly never had to worry about how to put shoes on the feet of my children. But that generation, it was a matter of walking in humble trust and knowing God will provide and knowing God will not let us down and knowing that very often God would meet our needs through other Christians. Because at just the moment where that encouragement was needed, along it would come. There's a story from the early days of Highland evangelicalism, and you may think this is a nut story, but it, it comes from Loch Caron, where there was a, a believer on one side of the loch who was praying, I think in his barn, we're talking the 1700s, who had this sudden impression that he had to take his barrel of, of meal, of oatmeal, and throw it in the loch. And it wouldn't go away. And he thought, this is crazy. This is for feeding my family. Worked hard last season to have this barrel of meal. And yet this, this thought was so clearly there. Got to throw it in the loch. And you may think, what crazy thing to do. But he did. Took the barrel, sealed it, threw it in the loch, and the waves and the wind carried it away. Meanwhile, on the other side of Loch Caron is a desperately hungry family of believers who are crying out to God, how are we going to feed the bellies of our children? There's nothing left. There's no money. There's no man maybe in the house looking after us. What are we going to do? And the Lord sends a barrel of meal that comes up on the tide. It's not often that God sends an angel to encourage us. Why would God bother sending an angel to encourage us when God can send me to encourage you? And God can send you to encourage me. Were you encouraged by Neil and Rachel this morning and spurred on to love and good works? Were you encouraged by our presenters and singers and musicians and spurred on to love and good works? That's what church should be in the way we see one another's needs. If you want to serve people, there are plenty people needing to be served. If you want to encourage people, there are plenty people needing to be encouraged. And maybe we're down and we're gloomy because it's been a long time since we really asked God, how can I encourage another person, Lord? How can I serve another person, Lord? I know we get lonely. And I really believe that isolation is one of the most dangerous things that we face and that the devil will use lonely and isolated Christians. Uh, he, will, he will attack them. We need each other. We need fellowship. You know, having a picnic or having a walk or having a family meal as a church or having a, a prayer meeting or having a fellowship time or having a youth fellowship or, or having a barbecue or whatever... These are not, oh, why do we do these things? Isn't it just a lot of work? No, it gets us together. And if we're lonely or struggling, or honestly, if we're weak, strength will come when we sit down and someone takes us by the hand and says, how can I pray for you? And maybe shares some encouragement that they have received from God with us. See these chairs over there? They're over there for a reason, so that maybe after church a wee group of people might just gather to pray and encourage one another. Because we're all qualified to do that. We're all priests if we're followers of Jesus. We're all able to take the word of God and like prophets speak to one another the gospel. And we're all able to say to those who are feeling their weakness, yes, but Jesus is strong. 
those who are feeling lonely, yes, but I'm with you and the Lord is with you. This is what Hebrews is encouraging the wobbling Hebrew Christians to do. Turn from sin to God. Turn from pain and suffering to the promises of God and the great future he's got planned for us. And turn from loneliness, fear, weakness to encourage each other, to strengthen each other, leave the isolation and learn to think more and more about one another. Building up a church with a culture of encouragement. I remember preaching in this place years ago, before the church was remodeled, which probably more than 10 years ago. And I remember um, building up, you know, sometimes you build up and you, you sort of, you've got an idea in your head and you're building up towards it. And I was building up to saying, that the devil's greatest tool is discouragement. And I said one Sunday, Sunday morning I think it was, you know, the devil's greatest tool, do you know what it is? It's, and I paused for dramatic effect. And one of the deacons was sitting over there. And he was one of the least charismatic people you would ever come across very buttoned up Hebridean gentleman he blurted it out discouragement amen he was right the devil uses discouragement we all get discouraged from time to time but here is a bible that says a hundred times in the new testament one another one another one another. Encourage one another. And the devil will just have to clear out, pick up his bags and go. Don't you want to be growing more and more to love the people of God who encourage you and you encourage them? When the going gets tough, and it will, remember you have a family in Christ. You have brothers, you have sisters, you have fathers, you have mothers, you have spiritual children and nephews and nieces, and we are here for one another under Christ when we sin, when we suffer, when we're lonely, when we're weak. Christ says, come, come with confidence. And hold on to the faith you profess. Because the Satan who says to you, give it all up, is a liar. Father in heaven, you will not allow that liar to discourage us. You will not allow that liar to rob us of peace and of forgiveness and of hope. You have given us your word and you have given us a hundred times in your word commands and encouragements to come together in love, in unity, in humility, in prayer. So help us then, Lord, to welcome Christ and to welcome each other into our hearts and into our prayers. Amen.